Hey, how's everybody doing today? It's Sean here for Canadian Brewing Channel, and today I'm going to do my first brewing video. I'm so excited. It is going to be a clone of a Kolsch. A Kolsch is a style of beer from Germany, which is kind of like a lager, but it uses ale yeast and you ferment it really low, low temperature, like about 62 degrees. Never done this before. I'm so excited about it. I can't wait to get going. Uh, I am now going to show you, if we take a look here, we can see the actual recipe in front of you, and it is right there, Kolsch clone. And you can see I'm using 9 pounds of Pilsner, 10% Carahel, I'm going to use 1 ounce of Spalt Pellet, and 1 ounce of Tetman. And that's going to be 60, set, a 60 minute oil for the Spalt, now to give it a bit of bitterness, and the Tetman is going to be 15 minutes before flame it. You can see that the alpha acids are very low, they're at 3.8, 3.4, so it's not going to be high bittering beer, which you don't want with a Kolsch. You want a nice, crisp, clean, delicious drinking beer, almost like when you're drinking a lager. The yeast I'm going to use is USO5. It's a yeast I've used many times. I tried to get a Kolsch yeast, but they didn't have any stock, but that's okay, because USO5, if you're going to ferment at 62 to 65 degrees, it's going to be nice and clean. Of course, I'm going to use a yeast nutrient to help out my yeast. I'm going to pitch straight in the yeast. I am not going to make a starter for this beer. It's not a high gravity beer. And I am going to use Warflock to help uh, clear it up at the end as well. I'm also going to uh, be kegging this beer and it should be ready probably within a month of this video. Now I've used a uh, mash calculator online and it shows me that I'm going to need 104, sorry, 158 degree Fahrenheit stripe water to give me 147 degrees Fahrenheit mash temperature. And I will be mashing at one hour, okay? One hour I want to mash for. So it's going to be a five gallon size batch, of course. And it shows me that I'm going to need 8.17 gallons of water. I'm going to be mashing with 3.75 gallons of water and sparging 4.42. And that should give me what I'm looking for in my work style. All right, with no further ado, we're gonna get going on this brew day. Woohoo! Okay, and now here I'm gonna uh, measure out my grains uh, uh, for my Kolsch. And uh, it's uh, nine pounds I'm looking for of uh, pills, some pills in there, so I'm gonna start adding that in. And I've got my scale here, which I've zeroed out. Need a bigger bowl because uh, <laughs> that's not holding that much. But. And now it's time to uh, mill the grain. in this container 
with hot water and then when I put the grain in it should drop down to about 147. So here's a trick and the tip that I learned is I look and say okay right now I'm at 164 degrees Fahrenheit. If I put this in here that's like six degrees above my strike temp. No. I put the water in here this container is probably 70 degrees. It's going to drop the temperature of my strike water. So I'm going to put water in here that's hotter than 158 until it drops down to 158. Then I'm going to dough in. Doughing in, of course, means taking my grains and adding them to the water to make a mash. So right now, yeah, I'm about 164, and I'm going to put the right amount of water it says to put in here. And where are we here? Strike water. We've got 150 degrees. Mash, 3.75 gallons of water going in here. Um, now I've got the grain all milled and just wanted to show you um, what it looks like when it's been milled. Um, it's, it's got a little bit of uh, what people say called flour, but I mill it as fine as I can. It gets my efficiencies up and basically you get a stuck sparge if you, uh, you mill it too clean or too tight. Um, I used to have efficiency issues, I'd only be getting like 65 to 70 percent. And I read online about uh, closing in uh, the, uh, the gap on your mill and I closed it just a little bit more and I got efficiencies around 75 to 80 now. Uh, no problem and no stuck sparge. Okay, so it actually dropped even more than I would have imagined in the last five minutes. It's down about one, uh, 157.5, but that's okay. Um, I'm down below the lower temp I want to be, meaning for 147, but We'll, we'll do with that. I don't add any more water to this. So now this is where I'm going to what's called mash in. It's much easier with two people, but I'm not by myself today. Change your angle here so you can watch how I put the grain in here. Paddle in, and here we go. And the reason I'm pouring it slowly and stirring at the same time is I don't want any clumps of grain getting together. All right. They're called dough balls. There's a lot of names that brewers use. It's kind of funny, when I first started brewing, uh, it confused me. I actually, the, the best thing you probably do if you want to start all green brewing, or brewing at all for, for that matter, is go online and type in the glossary terms for brewing and print them out. Because the very first time that I was learning how to brew and brewing myself, I was reading these as I went. There's a lot of abbreviations. Um, I don't think I probably know every single one yet. <laughs> But I know most of them, and uh, it helps out a lot when you know what these uh, three-letter words mean a lot of <laughs> like ABV and things like that. We will go through. I'm going to make a separate video also on uh, the abbreviations as well to help help out with that because I found I had to go to a lot of different sites to get all my info, and I wish that I could have found a, a site that would have absolutely everything that I was looking for as a beginner brewer. So. I am not an advanced brewer, I'm a beginning brewer, and I think partially intermediate, but I don't want to toot my horn because I'm sure there's people that will find this channel and say, you're only a beginner brewer. <laughs> it's all about having fun, this is a really fun hobby. Okay, I think I've got all the mash balls out of there, check my temp. It's a few minutes to come up. I suspect that I'm a little low um, at 147.6, so 0.4 off. A lot of people would say that's damn good. It is pretty good, but I like to be as picky as possible when it comes to mashing out. Okay, now we're gonna wait one hour for our mash. Okay, uh, 
One thing I gotta do here now that the mash has been about 15 minutes sitting is I have to take a pH reading. It's a very important reading for mash. It helps for uh, conversion and other flavors you don't want to come through in a mash. The mash pH you want between usually 5.1 and 5.5, or 5.12, 5.5, 5.3 is a sweet spot. So I have a uh, pH meter here, right here, and I'm just gonna check it now. Now I've cooled this down to around room temperature. If you don't and you just stick this right in your mash, you'll ruin your pH meter. And we have really hard water here, so I use reverse osmosis water, but it can still be an issue getting the pH down. We still get a buffering issue. So yeah, right now, I have a pH of 5.8. That's not, that's not good. Let's go down a little bit. 5.7. So that's out of range. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use some lactic acid. You can also use other acids. Um, Sorry, not lactic, lactic acid, this is phosphoric. Lactic sometimes with a really light beer, I can smell the lactic, so I try not to use it. So I'm gonna add this and I'll, re I'll come back, we'll try another pH reading. Okay, so I've done it again. I've gone in and I put some more acid in here, actually the first amount of acid, just gonna check it. Yeah, I'm much happier now. Now we're showing 5.4, which is very acceptable. Right here. Oh, 5.3. It can it can take a few minutes to drop down, but uh, that's that's a perfect number right there. 5.3. I had to use uh, quite a bit of lactic acid to get it, or sorry, phosphoric to get it down. Um, I will go on in other videos how important it is. Uh, I will do step by step on why it's important to have a good pH and uh, all the other different aspects I've learned in brewing. But for now, no further ado, we'll come back after the mash is done and we'll start to sparge. Woohoo! So I just want to show you, you can see my hand through here, how clear the wort has gotten. I mean, it's like super clear. This is after I've probably whirl off the off about uh, two and a half gallons. It gets so clear. Like, it's awesome. Okay, so I've finished all of the water draining down out of my oil kettle, but it's still running down through through my grain bed, and it's gonna probably take another 10, 15 minutes to do that. So what I'm gonna do now is I've added some of my collected water already into my oil kettle. I'm gonna start heating it up while I wait for the end of this to finish. Okay, so come over to my propane. Turn it on, light her up, and that'll save me uh, a few minutes of time because when the wort's being collected, it's only coming out at about 155 degrees. I gotta get this up to boiling. I should have about seven, six and a half to seven gallons of uh, wort that I've collected, so I may as well start heating it up now. Uh, what we're going to do next is once I get the rest of this work collected and I, and I get a, a level amount, I write this down. What I have is beer recipes and this is my binder and this has all of the beer that I've brewed in the last couple of years. I have everything printed out and I write down little notes as we go. That's the most important thing you can do when you're brewing beer. Notes. What's worse than brewing a beer that tastes horrible is brewing a beer that tastes amazing and you can't re replicate it. So if you don't have good notes, you're never gonna be able to replicate a beer again, okay? It's called repeatability is what they call it in the, uh, the brewing area, or the brewing people. Repeatability is the hardest thing to do. Brewmasters that work for the big breweries, that's all they do, they have certain beers they have to make that's all they do, repeat, repeatability. And they can because they've done it many, many times, they're all well educated, they have all the equipment to do it, but they measure everything, everything. You don't have to do that. I don't wanna make this over complicated. This is my first video. I'm just giving you uh, a few tips on what I've had to learn over the last couple of years with whole grain brewing. Is it's important that when you build a recipe, whatever recipe you start with, I'm sure 
everything's going to be great. You've got to make sure you write every single step down. Okay? We're talking how much grain, of course. I mean, we talk about the recipe. That's the grain uh, weight and what kind of grain, what kind of yeast, what kind of hops, uh, the water you use, and then the times that you, uh, you know, when you boil everything, when you add the hops. I try to make sure I write everything, everything down. Something went off on my measurements. I write that down. If I don't, then the beer comes out great, and the next time I measure everything, it comes out correct. It won't be the same beer. So. If this beer comes out amazing, I'll be like, oh, that mistake I made wasn't a mistake last time. It actually was something I should do next time. So this is important, this is a tip. Write down everything. And it's really cool to go back over the years, you know, and all the different things I write here and go, oh, I'm gonna make that beer again and I can make it damn close. So just a tip. So the next thing I'm going to do now, I've got all the work collected in here. I ended up with six and three quarter gallons of water. And I believe what we're supposed to have here, 6.4. I got a little bit more. That's okay. Uh, if my gravity reading is a little lower, I'll just boil a little more. So for you out there that don't know what a gravity reading is, it's percent of a uh, percentage of sugar in your water that's going to give you that level of gravity. Um, and it, with different charts you can use, will tell you how much alcohol you possibly could make. So right now I have in my hand a nifty little gadget you can get on Amazon. Okay, it's, it's an awesome tool. It's a refractometer. So what it does is when I take a little bit of the wart with my little dropper here, and I place it on this plate, and I close it, I look through the light, there's a little scale in there that tells me a line of how many bricks I have Bricks is a measurement of sugar in water, B-R-I-X. And this one also has, on the side of it, the, uh, the, the gravity readings, like from 1.0, that's, that's nothing in the water. That's, that's, your, that's zero specific gravity. So this has specific gravity on it, so I can guesstimate how much sugar I have in my water. So I'm gonna take one right now, reading. Okay. Gonna go over the sink with this. Now, I'm doing this on the fly a little bit. You should cool the work down to approximately about 60 to 70 degrees so you get proper reading. But I just want to quick, quickly look at what I am right now. Okay, I am at 1.040. So that is 1040 is what we would call that. I don't know if you'll be able to see that in here at all. I doubt it, there's no light in here. This does not have a light inside of it. Um, but 1.040 is a pretty good gravity to start with because as we boil this down for approximately an hour, it's probably gonna go up to about 050, okay? So we'll talk about that as, as we go through the brew. All right. Okay, we're almost up to a boil in a few minutes there. Oh, I gotta watch to make sure that I don't get it over foaming, which we are okay right now. I've got a little paddle here that I use to help stir that as it goes. But I want to show you also a tip on what I do to keep organized in my brew day. So if you see how I have everything laid out here. So uh, if you take a look from the right hand side, that's my first hops that I'm going to uh, put in. So the German spalt is going in first, so that's at the 60 minutes. And then at the 15 minute period, I have my tetanang that's gonna go in. Also one of my Warflock tablets, which is what helps the, uh, the beer go clearer. It, it takes a lot of the stuff out of the wort before we make it into beer. And then I have a, uh, a yeast nutrient, which helps the yeast, and it also goes in at the 15 minutes. So that's something that um, I do so I keep everything in a schedule and I don't lose anything. Next thing I have here, this is called the hop spider. In it goes. You can see my foam is starting to collect. That will start to build up until we have what's called a hot break, where the proteins separate and you then get into a nice vigorous boil. But this hop spider, it keeps a lot of the, uh, the hops from getting into the bottom of the kettle because this here, is my trusty plate chiller, which I use 
to, uh, to cool the wort, which you'll see when we have to go to pitching temperature of approximately 65 to 68 degrees. Yep, we're getting up to a boil now. Actually, I'll just let you see this. Here it goes, this hot break. This is where I have to slow it down or you're gonna end up with a boil over. It's kind of like when you uh, you make spaghetti or potatoes, same kind of thing. So you wanna make sure you drop the temperature down a bit. Some, some people will use like a spray, uh, like a water spray, a mister. I'm not too worried about this because I'm only at about seven or seven gallons, six and a half gallons. So and you'll see that I'm gonna get a boil going here soon. Turn it up a bit. Sorry, I'm doing this with one hand. I'm holding the, the camera. Yeah, you can see it there now. There we go. So this time now, get some scissors. And we're going to introduce the first Pops, it's a German Spult. I always double check to make sure my recipe says that's what we're doing. Always double check. Got my recipe. Here it is. Spult for 60 minutes. Make sure I got my boil going good. Oh yeah, good boil. 60 minutes. Time is 10:44. We'll call that 10:45. Ingle the hops into the hop spider. Alrighty. Hops are all out of there. Okay, at this point in time, I'm going to wait 45 minutes. And that gives us 15 minutes left, and then I'll see you then. Okay, so we're approaching the 15 minute end of the boil. So I'm going to add right now my Aurora flock. That's for helping clarify the wort and the beer at the end and then I've also got my yeast nutrient which is really important to make sure the yeast has you know it's nice and healthy it's like giving it uh, vitamins and minerals before it goes on a long journey of happy happy making beer so we've got those two things in I'm just going to give them a quick stir and we're about to add our last Pops addition at the 15 minute mark, and we got just a few seconds here. Another thing I like to do is smell my hops. Oh, some people they get disgusted when they smell hops, they're not beer people. It's it's just like standing in a garden of herbs and oh, citrus and everything. It's, it's just I love the smell of it. I remember when I was a kid, I'd go by a brewery and I wonder what all those smells were. Well. I know what they pretty much all are now. It smells so good. Okay, we're right now at the time we have to add 50 minute hops. And they go. Make sure they're all in there. And whenever I use a hop spider, I'll always give it a little bit of a stir inside of the spider. Make sure the hops are all getting filled in there. Mix it around. We're nearing the end of the brew day, for the first part anyway, we've got another 15 minutes to go. Then from there I'm going to hook up all of my uh, cooling system and I've already uh, sanitized my fermenter which I'll explain about what I do for sanitization and why sanitization is important. And what I think I'm going to do now too is there's so much information to give you guys and I don't want to fill my video up with a bunch of gobbledygook. Uh, so I'm going to make a video or more videos after this video that aren't to do with actually doing the physical brew, but actually talking about all the different things I've learned about how to make great beer. So without further ado, I'll see you in 15 minutes. Okay, so we're right about at what's called flame out. After the full 60 minute boil is done, we've done our two hop additions, our final one went in at the 15 minute mark. And right now we are at flame out. So I'm gonna turn off the natural gas Sorry, profane I'm using right now. And that stops 
any of the boil and it then is like you're finished your, your boil there's no more uh, uh, hot bittering per se that you're going to get you get more of the bittering when you're boiling um, you get hot flavors when you add them uh, just before flame out or after flame out but the important thing I have to do now is I'm going to take my hot spider out set it aside and I'm going to do what's called a whirlpool where I am going to make a whirlpool by stirring everything and what that will create is turn this off it will create a vortex in all of the, the, the all the junk that you collect um, truck gets stuck in the middle and creates a cone so that when I go through my plate chiller here it doesn't clog it up so now I'm just going to take my hop spider out just let it drain out of it don't want to lose any of that delicious wort because that's all going to be turned into beer oh yeah I wish there was smell of it this smells so good okay so this is an important step I didn't do it first and I, it caused me headaches without doing this stir you're gonna end up with all of the trub everything that settles in here bits of hot debris plugging up your plate chiller I'll have another video on what a plate chiller is but it's basically uh, a bunch of plates in a row with cold water going through one way and the wart not touching it of course goes through the other way and it really cools quickly I can cool from 200 degrees to 68 degrees no problem and I can have it run through the, the plate chiller in about five minutes um, they're probably the, one of the most efficient chillers there are but they're the most difficult to use because of, like I said you get all sorts of minerals or deposits that are in the, the bottom of the uh, the foil kettle they can plug this up so it is a little difficult to use it works great if you've got pumps and you've got pre-filters but I have neither I'm using gravity so now I've done my whirlpool I'm gonna let this sit for another 15 minutes and then we'll come back and I'll, I'll show you how we, uh, we get the work chill into our carboy okay we're back and I've done my whirlpool and everything is settled in fairly centered. It's hard to tell because it's a little bit uh, it's opaque. You can't see too far through there. Um, and I'll quickly go show you right now what you're looking at here is my boil kettle here which is full of hot wort. It, uh, right now we're at about 170 degrees and it's going to run down this tube here. It's then going to go through the wort in and come back out through the wort out and it's going to go down into this fermenter which I have sanitized. Now I don't know if it's picking it up there if you can see the bubbles people think that's soap. No that's star sand which is the sanitizer that I use and it's a great sanitizer and there's a there's a saying about this sanitizer don't fear the foam. Uh, the reason they say that is because it's a non-rinse sanitizer. This sanitizer does not have to be rinsed out at all. It's it's the best sanitizer I've, I've used. Uh, sorry, I got my head cut off here, but I want you to be able to see this when it runs. So, I used to use chlorinated sanitizers. Don't use that. Star Sand is awesome. It's basically phosphoric acid, and then there's another thing that's in there that helps to kill off any bacteria or, or even yeast they'll kill off. But when you don't rinse it out, and it has no flavor to it, foam's not going to hurt, so you don't get the foam. So, now what I'm going to do is I have to turn the water on get it going so it helps to chill the water as it goes through. I'll be off camera for a bit of this so we'll just be watching this fill up. I'll we'll probably fast forward so it looks a lot less boring. Okay so off I go. I gotta go turn my water on. Thank you. 
fairly well. Uh, I got this down to probably around 61 degrees, 60 degrees. The reason I was off uh, camera is because I was monitoring the water temperature coming out of this plate chiller over by my sink and by adjusting the water flow I knew what the temperature was coming out of this tube and I want to pitch this yeast as soon as I can and I want it to be around 60, 61 degrees. So I'm just going to quickly show you what I mean by when I did the whirlpool and I got the trough in the middle so it didn't end up a lot of it into uh, the container here in my carboy. It worked out really well. I'll give you a quick look. So in the center there, that's trough. That's the stuff that you do not want in your, your wort, which will turn into beer. So that worked out really well. Okay, so next thing I'm gonna do with this is I am going to use my tube over here for uh, aerating, uh, oxygenating. Actually, I have oxygen I'm gonna use. Um, normally, if I'm doing an ale at 68 to 70 degrees, you do not have to aerate or oxygenate, believe it or not, when you're using dry yeast. It's all ready to go without it. And if you don't have oxygen and you start shaking it around to try and aerate the wort from using dry yeast, you could introduce bacteria in there that you don't need to. So the only reason I'm gonna aerate this, or sorry, uh, oxygenate is because I'm gonna do it at a uh, cold temperature, I'm gonna be fermenting this ale to about 60 degrees. Okay, so I'll get set up for that and you can watch me uh, oxygenate. Okay, so I've got my oxygen tank here and I'm gonna to start to oxygenate. It only has to be done for approximately 30 seconds because this is pure oxygen. And if you do it longer than that and you open this up too much, this tank won't last too long. It only lasts about 10 or 15 times. So just turn this slowly until I start to open it. I find the valve takes very little to open it once it gets there and it starts over oxygenating it. And just to be fair, it goes there. So how fast that is going through. I just want to slow there. Nice. Like that. It's almost like trying to balance an egg on a toothpick. So you just get it rolling like that and oxygenating uh, with this way. You only have to do it like, so for like 30 seconds. If you wanted to aerate with an air stone, you're talking 20 minutes, 30 minutes to get the same amount of oxygen because this is just pure oxygen. Also, I'm not introducing anything in here like bacteria. And everything's been sanitized, like everything always is with beer. So that should be pretty good for oxygenating. I think that uh, it's already ready. For, it doesn't need really the oxygen, but I did it as an added step. That's oxygenation. The last step we're going to have now is pitching the yeast. Okay, this is the magic time I always love. This is where I am going to pitch my US05. This yeast is awesome. It's a clean fermenting yeast. It doesn't give off any esters. Esters are different aromas you can get in your beer, like banana, apple, um, this one is very clean as long as it's fermented at the proper temperatures. Any yeast will give you off flavors and aromas uh, if you're outside of its parameter. It stresses the yeast. I have sanitized the scissors. I have sanitized the outside of this yeast. I am now going to pitch into this sanitized Get them all out, all those billions and billions of cells. Alrighty, the next thing I will do is I just take this off. This is also sanitized by the way, this cover here. And I'm just going to give the yeast a bit of a little bit of a mix into the wort to help it uh, introduce it into the wort. And that's it. I'm gonna do is just set it in place. Okay, so I've now got all of my wort into my carboy. It's it's got the yeast in it. So right now those yeast cells are starting to starting to absorb the wort, and very soon in the next 12 to 24 hours, they're ready to start multiplying and start eating the sugars that are in there and creating alcohol because that's what they do. They they inhale or drink or eat, I should say, the, uh, the carbohydrates, the simple carbs, 
and they excrete alcohol as a favor saying thank you for me feeding them. Um, at the top here, I have a lock. Okay, it's, a, it's basically so that none of the uh, nasties can get inside of there. So that there is sanitizer that's in there. Okay, and I've got it right now on a piece of styrofoam off of the cement. And one of the reasons for that is it can crack. There's any, anything underneath uh, the glass carboy can break if it's uh, on the cement. But one of the other reasons is I've got against that uh, red wall there on the left. That there is an outside wall, so it gets pretty cool. And if I put this piece of insulation in front of it, I started playing around with this about uh, two or three days ago, and I put a temperature probe in there, and I can hold around 61 degrees Fahrenheit. Just it's sitting like that, which is what I want for fermentation. Um, it will go up a little bit in temperature once it gets to its active fermentation. It'll go up three or four or five degrees. That's fine. I'm trying to keep it at the lower end, but if I had it up on the shelf uh, where I normally ferment at 68 or 70 degrees, it can go well above 75, which can give off some uh, esters, you know, different uh, aromas and flavors that I don't want. This is a Colch clone, so I want it to be as crisp and clean as I can get it to be. I'm trying to almost mimic a lager in a way. So with no further ado, that is the end of this video. Thank you very much guys for watching this video and I will be adding more videos as we go. All right, well that wraps up my first brew day on my brewing channel. I'm so happy you guys could watch this with me. It's so much fun. I hope you guys want to get into brewing. That's what I want to do is get you guys motivated to do something like this. It's an amazing hobby and I, I love doing it every single time. Some hobbies come and go. This one I've been doing for quite a few years now and I'm having a great time in it. So please subscribe to my channel. And if you do, remember to click the little button down there that's a little bell so that next time I do a video, it'll let you know that I've done one. Um, this has been a great fun today and I can't wait until I do the tasting, which will be in about a month from now. And it'll be the Kolsch clone test taste testing. So today's will be uh, part one and there will be a part two to follow in about a month to six weeks from now. So thanks again for watching my channel. Sean signing off. Have a great week. Thank you.